Persia, now called Iran, is a fascinating country. It has been a major power since before the foundation of Rome, and even since the dawn of civilization, and it still shapes today the politics of the Middle East and Eurasia. Right in the middle between Europe and Asia, it's been a major center of trade, learning, and cultural exchanges. It is also a remarkably durable center of power, always re-emerging no matter how many times it got invaded or conquered. This documentary will delve deep into where Persia comes from and what made it so successful and unique among the world's great civilizations. The area of modern-day Iran in historical Persia has been inhabited since early prehistory. It also saw some of the earliest agricultural villages in 7200 BC, notably Choga Golan and Choga Bonat, in the Zagros Mountain, in the west of the region, and forming the western border of modern-day Iran. We know from these sites that wild barley, lentils, and various legumes were cultivated. We also found a 7,000-year-old jar of wine, now on display at the University of Pennsylvania. The culture of the region has been deeply intertwined with one of Mesopotamia, or current-day Iraq. One of the first cities, the Sumerian city of Uruk, is considered to have extended eastward, creating the city of Susa in 4395 BC, or maybe even earlier. The city of Susa would become the capital of Elam, the very first defined nation in what would become Persia. It would stay an important economic and trade center until its destruction by the Mongols some 5,500 years after its foundation. Instead of a modern nation-state, Elam was most likely a coalition of different people and tribes living in the mountain. Alam was the name given to them by the Mesopotamian civilization, and they most likely called themselves something like Haltami, or those of the high country. This defined characteristic of the Persian people, the people of the mountain, would stay, and it would contrast the people of the plain to the west in modern-day Iraq. The two would often fight, and at times, dominate each other. The rough terrain was not suitable for the irrigation-heavy type of agriculture practice in the plain, so life was most likely structured around semi-nomadic pastoralism, with small-scale agriculture in a limited area along the bottom of the valleys. This made for less numerous but also rougher, hardier people than the more sophisticated farming culture of the plain. So in many ways, the Iraq-Iran conflict in the 80s? was just the last episode in a 6,000-year-long conflict between the plain people and the mountain people, and who would dominate the area. Little is known about Alam's everyday life, because we're still not able to translate their writing, which started from around 3200 BC. The Elamite language, now extinct, seems to have been a completely different language from any other from the region. However, progress has been made recently to decipher Elamite writing, so we might soon learn a lot more about them. A unique feature of Elam's culture was a focus on animals and their art, especially dogs and bulls. This was very different from the Sumerians, Akkadians, or Egyptians, who favored human or animal-human hybrid figures. Elamite art indicates a polytheist religion, with a strong focus on nature and a mother goddess, with rituals done in sacred groves or mountains. This was also a very tolerant religion, that tolerated the gods of its neighbors and even progressively incorporated them into the Elamite pantheon. Some aspect of their religion was passed upon to later religion in Persia, notably Zoroastrism. For example, using elevated places for worship, or the personification of deities of natural powers. Another interesting aspect of Elamite culture was a great respect for women. They are represented as equal in art, and queens are shown as equal to the king. 
This cultural trait would be preserved later in the position of women in Persian societies. In an earlier era, Elam was frequently invaded by its more powerful neighbors from the plains, which was more populous thanks to highly advanced irrigation systems. In fact, Elam is the loser in the first ever recorded war, with the invasion and looting by the Sumerians of Elam in 2700 BC. Susa would also be under Sumerian control, under the rule of the legendary Sargon of Akkad. But nothing lasts forever, and by 1100 BC, Elam was the rising power in the region. King Shutruk Nahanti went on a series of conquests, rolling over most of the cities around Babylon. Later, Alam would stay powerful, but would fail to rule the region due to infighting between the heirs of King Shutruk. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, would in turn conquer Alam in 1120 BC, illustrating the difficulty in obtaining a lasting victory in the region. We know Alam was trading with the whole known world, and not just its neighbors. We found in Susa plenty of artifacts from the Hindus Valley civilization in modern-day Pakistan. We also found objects from eastern Iran and Afghanistan, showing the existence of an active trade network, both by boat and by land. Afghanistan was also one of the major sources of tin, an essential metal to make bronze, the most advanced metal of the period. No doubt, Alam must have been involved in that trade and maybe resold tin from the east to the Mesopotamians, or even the Egyptians. They were also selling stone, metal, and wood that was lacking in the more desertic plains, crossed by the Tigris-Euphrates river system. This trading road would keep getting more and more important, and slowly involved in the Silk Road, connecting Europe to Asia, with Persia as the connecting point between the two. Progressively, Alam's power faded with the entry of the Iranian or Aryan people into the region. They were nomads who originated from the steppes of Eurasia, living a life similar to proto-slaves, Turks, and Mongols. Over time, Alam and Iranians started to mix, especially in the south of the country. This was a gradual process that stretched over more than a millennium, starting in 2000 BC. Elamite culture would persist long after the Iranian people became dominant in the region. For example, the Elamite language was for a long time used as the main administrative language. This would indicate that if the Iranians ruled and colonized the area, the legal and administrative system was still manned by native Elamites. One of these Iranian groups, the Medes started to federate the region under the banner of the first real Iranian emperor, Deuces, who refined from 727 to 675 BC, according to Herodotus. To give you an idea, the highly embellished tales of the 300 Spartans fighting Persia were from Herodotus. So while important, Deuces might not have actually been the ruler of the whole of Iran. In any case, the Medes' unification was in large part a reaction to the brutal conquest and oppression by the Assyrian Empire. Deuces' grandson, Zyaxares, would ally with the Babylonian and destroy the capital of the Assyrians, Nineveh, in 612 BC. By 700 BC, the area was mostly populated by Iranian people, like the Medes, Persians, and Parthians. The Medes might have been the founder of the first Iranian Empire and the downfall of the Assyrians, but it would be another group that would take the lead of the region. The Persians, under Cyrus the Great, would form the first Persian Empire, also called the Achaemenid Empire. Cyrus the Great was a vassal of the Medes that rebelled in 553 BC and then went on to conquer the world. By 539 BC, he had conquered Babylon. In 533 BC, he would enter in India and conquer the western part of it. We don't know much about him before he went on overthrowing the Medes and taking over the whole Middle East. It seems he started his rebellion when a Medes general, Harpagus, was sent to attack Cyrus. 
But instead, Cyrus and Harpagus teamed up on the Medes' empire. How did that happen? What did Cyrus promise Harpagus? No one really knows as the stories of the time, including from Herodotus, are too full of mythology and inventions to be relied on. But we know that later, Harpagus would become one of Cyrus's top generals. Who knows? Maybe Harpagus saw early in Cyrus the great ruler he would become. So what made Cyrus the great? First, he unified the Iranian people into a structured and stable empire. He created a central administration with governors called satraps. Most of the contemporary sources agree that they managed their domain efficiently to the benefit of the common people. It also helped that satraps were regularly checked by the king's eyes, a network of spies reporting directly to Cyrus. The empire also had four capitals, reflecting a large level of autonomy for each region. Still, the center of the administration was at Susa, the old Elamite center of power. It relied on an advanced post system where couriers would always find fresh food, water, a bed, and horses at a maximum of two days of travel. The system Cyrus created would be kept almost identical by successive empires and invaders until the Muslim conquests a millennium and a half later. His influence on legal work has reached so far in time that Thomas Jefferson read Cyrus's biography by Xenophon, the Cyropedia, as one of the sources of inspiration for the United States Declaration of Independence. Secondly, he's the king that conquered Babylon in 539 BC and allowed the Israelites to leave Babylon, where they were enslaved. For the Hebrew Bible, this was a task Cyrus had been appointed to by God himself. This made Cyrus the only non-Jewish figure in the Bible praised as a messiah. Third, Cyrus was known to respect the culture and religion of the people he conquered. He is considered by Iranians as the father. He was considered by Babylonians as the liberator, which says a lot about his style of ruling compared to the old Babylonian elite. Fourth, he was the founder of the famous military division of the 10,000 men called the Immortals, which would stay the elite force of the Persian Empire to the end. Overall, as far as conquerors go, Cyrus was indeed a pretty good one. He created what at the time was the largest ever empire, and did it with a relatively limited amount of bloodshed and sparing civilian and local temples. His son would continue the tradition and conquer Phoenicia and Cyprus in 525 BC, followed the same year by the conquest of Egypt, Nubia, and part of modern-day Syria. To this day, the empire founded by Cyrus is the largest of all the successive Iranian empires. The tomb of Cyrus the Great is still standing in Iran and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Cyrus's greatest city, Persepolis, is to this day one of the greatest archaeological sites in the world. Following Cyrus's son came Darius I, the other great Persian emperor. Darius's reach would ultimately extend as far as an invasion of the Hindu's valley, today Pakistan. But he is more remembered for the first Persian invasion of Greece in 492 BC. Bad luck would strike, with the lack of troops coming partly from a fleet sunk by a storm, and by the fact that the invasion of Greece was a really small campaign by Persian standards. So, the invasion would fail at Marathon in 490 BC due to a mix of bad luck and insufficient troops. Angered by the Greeks' resistance and surprise victory, Darius had planned a second invasion, but he died in 486 BC before he could execute it, leaving the task to his son, Xerxes. Xerxes' management of Persian troops in the Greek campaign was average at best, and by now, the repeated Persian invasions had forced the often divided Greek city-states to unite. Still, he managed to burn Athens in 480 BC, which had been evacuated by its population. The Battle of Salamis in 480 BC would see the Greeks destroy the Persian fleet. Fearing being stuck in Europe, Xerxes retreated, 
He also had to put down a rebellion in Babylon at the same time. The remaining Persian troops on the continent were finally defeated at the Battle of Plataea in 479 BC. Xerxes would end up assassinated in 465 BC by the commander of the royal bodyguards. The Greeks and the Persians would keep fighting for influence over Anatolia and the Greek's islands for the centuries to come, with none really taking over the other. After Xerxes, Persia would stay one of the largest world powers for almost centuries. One of the impressive features of the Persian Empire would be its effort to improve the conditions of the semi-arid region. After all, it receives only 124 millimeters of water per year. Notably, Darius the Great would create the Shashtar Hydraulic System, a system of canals that would divert water from a river to the city of Shushtar, power multiple mills, creating a man-made cascade, and irrigating almost 100,000 acres of farmland and orchards. Another remarkable system, predating the Persians but greatly expanded by them, was the Khanids. They would take water from underground and carry it to fertile farmlands. These canals were mostly subterranean in order to limit evaporation. Because they tapped into the water tables, it would provide a small but steady water flow independent of the rain. The Khanid would also be immune from damage from war or flood, providing an extremely durable infrastructure to the inhabitant of the Persian Empire. Building a Khanid was a difficult task, as you needed the canal sloped downward to let the water flow but not too steep, or water would start eroding the canal and collapse it. They also made a unique footprint on the landscape, as vertical tunnels were dug at regular intervals to give access to the workers during the construction and for maintenance. Another innovation was the Yakchul, a dome of clay where Persians would pile up ice in winter to keep food cold the rest of the year. There are also claims that it is the Persians we have to thank for the invention of the kartar, the ancestor of the modern guitar. Another entertainment popular to this day is backgammon, the oldest surviving board game. The Persians also claim to have also invented chess, even if this is contested by India. The Persian culture and day-to-day -day life incorporated a wide array of regions and cultures. For example, slavery was relatively common in the areas of Babylon and Egypt, with a long history of slavery predating Persian rule. But overall, it seems slaves were just a minor portion of the society, and slavery was not a key component of it, less than in Greece or later in Rome. Persian women benefited from a remarkable amount of freedom by antiquity standards. They could own by themselves land, businesses, and money they could also travel freely. We also know that aristocratic women would ride horses and practice archery, activities that would have been kept only for men in other cultures like the Greeks. The only field apparently excluding women was ruling the country. One last innovation to be credited to the Persians is one of the first monotheist religions, Zoroastrianism. The religion was founded by Zoroaster or Zarathustra, the exact figure of Zoroaster is lost to history, with religious tradition putting him in the 6th century BC. But some historians believe him to be more of a 10th century BC figure turned into a myth. Zoroastrianism explains the world as a place of a battle between a supreme god of good versus a supreme god of evil. It also contained belief in free will, life after death, and theology of angels and demons, heaven and hell. Historians of religion consider that Zoroastrianism had a major influence on other Abrahamic religions, Buddhism and Greek philosophy. One example is the three Magi bringing gifts for Christ's birth in the Bible, also known as the three wise men. The term Magi refers to Zoroastrian priests. In Zoroastrianism, the God of good is omniscient, knows everything, but not omnipotent cannot do everything. Zoroastrianism also encouraged the protection and, to some extent, the veneration of nature, probably drawing from the older animist and polytheist beliefs of the Iranian people and the Elamites. Fire was playing a major role in the religion, 
with prayers usually done in the presence of a fire and sometimes flowing water. The Zoroastrian idea of the Law of Asha, or Truth and Righteousness, was also claimed as an inspiration for Cyrus the Great's style of ruling and lawmaking, even if he didn't impose Zoroastrianism on the people conquered by Persia. Zoroastrianism is still practiced today as a minor religion in India and Iran. Overall, the Persian Empire seems to have been a relatively tolerant and good one, as far as empires go. It would punish rebellions harshly, but then respect the local culture, customs, and religions of the conquered people. Its governing principles were autocratic, but with a goal of improving the common man's life and developing a just and productive system, run by an efficient administration with many safeguards against corruption and abuse of power. Persia was a brilliant civilization that contributed to the progress of mankind, as seen in more enlightened laws, women's rights, irrigation systems, and new religions. What Cyrus the Great and Darius the Great built would be brought down by an equally great conqueror. The Macedonian Alexander the Great. Alexander was a great admirer of Cyrus. Reading from an early age Xenophon's Cyropedia, one key aspect Alexander took from Cyrus's biography was his heroism in battle. Alexander was the king of Macedonia, a kingdom at the northern fringes of the Greek world. He was born in 356 BC and tutored personally by Aristotle. Yes, the Aristotle, the father of Western philosophy. Alexander was already commanding an army and ruling in his father's absence at 16 years old. And then he became king at only 20 years old. His father, Philip of Macedon, had united under one banner the Greek cities Illyria, the modern-day Balkans, and Thrace modern-day Bulgaria and eastern Greece. Philip was assassinated in 336 BC by the captain of his bodyguard, similar of the fate of Xerxes more than a century earlier. The beginning of Alexander's rule showed he could be ruthless. He had one of his cousins and two Macedonian princes executed. Whether they were responsible for the assassination of Philip or not is unsure. What is sure is that it made his position in the throne very secure. Alexander would also brutally put down any rebellion tentatively following the death of his father. It culminated when he made an example of Thebes, destroying the 1,000-year-old city in 335 BC and selling all of its citizens into slavery, sparing only pro-Macedonians and priests. Maybe out of genuine guilt or to appease his critics, Alexander would later on always show great generosity and favor to any surviving Theban he would meet in person. In any case, it worked at crushing any rebellious ideas in other Greek cities, including Athens. Alexander would follow by imitating Philip and taking the title of Hegemon, or Supreme Commander. In these early moments of his reign, Alexander would display a real military genius. He would stay undefeated in battle all his life, making him one of the greatest generals in history. Alexander invaded the Persian Empire in 334 BC with around 50,000 men, 6,000 cavalry, and a fleet of 38,000 men. He would conquer the western part of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, which was populated by Greeks but living under Persian rule, and then move on to Syria and the Levant. The Greco-Macedonian army met the much more numerous Persian army, at least twice bigger, at the Battle of Isis. The Persians were led by Darius III and he had cut the Greeks from the conquered territories. A big part of the legend of Alexander has been enhanced by the sheer ineptitude and cowardice of Darius III. At the Battle of Isis in 333 BC, the Persians attacked the Greeks in a narrow space between the sea and mountain blocking them from making use of their larger number. 
When the Persian army started to break under a Greek assault led by Alexander, Darius is said to have been the first one to flee. The view of the Persian emperor running for his life instead of rallying his troops led to the Persian army collapsing. This was the first time ever that a Persian army under the command of a Persian emperor would be defeated. One can imagine the shock it must have been to everybody, even Alexander himself. Darius left behind his wife, his two daughters, and even his mother, as well as symbols of his authority like his bow, chariot, and royal mantle. The female relative of Darius would be treated well, but Alexander would refuse to give up on his hostages, except for Darius recognizing him as the Emperor of Persia. Later on, Alexander would marry one of Darius' daughters in order to reinforce his claims on the throne. Alexander would go on to put siege to the Phoenician Tyre, now modern-day Lebanon. To punish it for its resistance, he would destroy the city in 332 BC, kill the men, and sell the women and children into slavery. Gaza would then resist as well, and even seriously wound Alexander in the shoulder. The city would then suffer the same fate as Tyre. After that, the whole of Egypt surrendered quickly. Many cities named Alexandria would be founded in the wake of the conquest, but the Egyptian Alexandria would go on from its foundation in 331 BC and become a major trade center and place of learning, harboring the lighthouse of Alexandria as well as the Great Library. Two years after the Battle of Isis, Darius would flee again at the Battle of Gogamela in 331 BC. This was despite once again commanding a larger army, fighting on a favorable terrain this time, and having competent and experienced soldiers and commanders. He apparently again fled first, way before any clear winner of the battle could be decided. From there, the Persian Empire would never recover. The rest of Persia fell right after, with Darius unable to successfully raise a full third army. The fate of the previous two must have made volunteers quite rare. In addition, the benevolence of Alexander to places that surrendered made it an attractive option at this point, and his brutality against Tyre and Gaza made it a bad bet to resist too hard as well. Alexander's military genius should not be dismissed, as he showed real prowess in his campaigns to keep control over his vassals since he was 16 years old. His ability to wield both diplomacy and horrific brutality also contributed to his lightning-quick conquest of the largest empire in the world. But a part of his astonishing success also stemmed from Darius's cowardice. Not once but twice did he single-handedly cause the rout of a Persian army twice the size of the Greeks by leading the way to safety. Quite the contrast with Alexander, which would constantly refuse the advice of his generals and lead the battle from the front line. This extreme level of risk taken by Alexander also had a huge impact. Both the Greek and Persian armies were an assembly of soldiers from very diverse and not always very loyal vassal states. When the Greek soldiers fought with Alexander, they didn't fight for the glory of Macedon, a state and culture many of them actively disliked. They fought for Alexander himself, who they had come to admire at a personal level for his courage. And in reverse, when the soldiers from Egypt or Babylon saw Darius fleeing, they hadn't much interest in fighting and risking their lives for a cowardly emperor. Many historians have tried to justify the fall of the Persian Empire as something almost inevitable. They describe the Persian Empire as divided, tired, and declining. But this can be contested. The Persian Empire managed, not once, but twice, to gather an army twice the size of the Greek army. It was not weakened by the previous rebellions or civil wars. There was very little defection by local rulers to Alexander. Overall, the Persian Empire seems to have been still a very functional, well-administrated empire. The Persian Empire might have fallen solely because of the extraordinarily unlucky combination resulting from the clash between two very different men. Darius III, a poor excuse of an emperor, and Alexander, a once-in-a-millennium military genius. 
By conquering the Persian Empire and uniting it with Greece and Macedon, Alexander had created the largest empire ever seen. The end of the campaign would see the Greek pillaging Persepolis for several days in 330 BC. A fire, intentional or not, started in the palace and burned down most of the imperial capital. It could have been revenge for the burning of Acropolis by Xerxes, or just an accident. Apparently, Alexander regretted it, but it was already too late to stop the fire. The relationship of the Greeks with the Persians was a strange one. A bitter rivalry and centuries of war, but also mutual respect, each recognizing the other as civilized in a way, something the Greeks did not extend to many other people. Plutarch tells us that Alexander paused by looking at a statue of Xerxes and asked the statue, Shall I pass by and leave you lying there because of the expeditions you led against Greece? Or shall I set you up again because of your magnanimity and your virtues in other respects? Alexander would end up hunting pretenders to the succession of Darius III all over Central Asia, in modern-day Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. Seemingly always restless, Alexander would decide to try and invade India next in 326 BC. The first battles were successful, but this would be one step too far. The men were at this point tired of war and wanted to go home and profit from the spoils of victory. Ultimately, the soldiers faithful to Alexander were in open revolt. They would still obey him and defend him, but conquer no more. Alexander would be back in the old Elamite city of Susa in 324 BC. During the campaign, Alexander started to try to build his legitimacy as a Persian emperor in the eyes of his new subjects. This led to tensions between his Greek troops and him. One remarkable example is when Alexander, drunk, would end up killing a friend that had saved his life previously. The deadly fight started over accusations that Alexander had become corrupted by an oriental lifestyle. Another issue was how to integrate the Greek and Macedonian veteran with the Persian officers. The initial mixing of command helped, giving Persian troops to Greek officers and the other way around. He also notably tried a wave of mass marriages between his officers and noble women of Susa, the now Persian old Elamite capital. This would not have durable effects. When finally settling back, he started to put in order to the administration, including executing several satraps that had proven themselves corrupt or disloyal. Shortly after he came back to Persia, Alexander died suddenly in 323 BC. The likely cause was a fever caught in a nearby swamp, but of course, previous attempts and his position led to speculation about poisoning. There are dozens of theories about his death, none conclusive. Some would find it somewhat poetic that a man able to bring down an empire and survive countless battles and injuries would not fall from intrigue, but an ordinary and unglorious cause like a disease. He would be buried in Alexandria, but what happens to his remains is unclear past the 2nd century AD. Conquest of Persia by Alexander would have lasting consequences. When Alexander was on his deathbed, his generals pushed him to name who the throne should be granted. He would have responded, to the strongest. This led to the fracture of the empire in four, Macedon and Greece, Thrace in the west of Anatolia, Persia proper with Central Asia, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and Egypt, which also ruled over part of the Levant, Cyprus, and South Anatolia. The fragments of Alexander's empire would stay under Greek control or influence for most of the next three centuries. This period is referred to as the Hellenistic period. The local population would actually not see their life changed by much. It was mostly the aristocracy that changed into fully Greek, or a mix of Greek and Persian or local culture. A good example is the Ptolemy dynasty. Started by General Ptolemy, they would rule uninterrupted until Roman times, basing their power and military recruitment on Greek colonists, but also adopting local customs. The last member of this dynasty would be Cleopatra, the lover of Julius Caesar, ending the Ptolem rule with her death in 30 BC. This Hellenization would later see the rise of a Greek empire in Central Asia, the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, 
which ironically would be the last surviving kingdom directly and culturally related to Alexander's conquest. So far from Greece, the Persian Empire soon turned into the Seleucid Empire, named after Alexander's general Seleucus. The Seleucid would be in a bitter rivalry with Ptolemaic Egypt. It would fail to hold on to the territory west of the Indus River and settle it as a natural border with the Indian Maurya people. The Seleucid would try to expand westward into Greece, but would be defeated by the Greeks and their Roman allies. This would weaken the empire and open it later to conquest by the Parthians. The Seleucid would turn out unable to hold on to their empire, with their most lasting legacy being the Hellenization of the region. That same process, pushed by a stream of an immigrant from Greece, would ultimately weaken the empire, with notably the Jewish population successfully rebelling. By the time of Christ, the Greek language would be used for language of learning, trade, and culture. The first Bible would be written in Greek as well. In the Near East and Iran, the Greek influence would slowly fade away, with a progressive return towards Iranian and Zoroastrian ideas. The Bactrians in Central Asia would turn out to be the last standing Hellenic kingdom, with a culture mixing Greek heritage and Buddhism, also called Greco-Buddhism. It is from this region that Buddhism spread toward China. The Parthians were an Aaronic nomadic people, living in modern-day Turkmenistan, not unlike the Medes and Persian before them. They were ruled by the Seleucid through Greek satraps until they rebelled and took over the empire. The one to accomplish that was Mithridates I the Great. He started wars in the east to control the Greco-Bactrians in 155 BC, and then occupied the Indus Valley and wars in the west to try to expand into Greco-Roman territory. This follows a now familiar pattern in Persian history. First, there are some natural geographic features, a center of power always based around modern-day Iran, and trying to expand east towards central and India, and west towards the Levant and Anatolia. Competent emperors manage to expand, bad ones see the empire contracting. When a dynasty really weakens, it gets replaced by nomadic invaders. First the Medes, then the Persians, and then the Parthians. For each nomad invasion, the pre-existing bureaucracy and lifestyle mostly stay unchanged, except maybe for the elite. The Parthian Empire was no exception. It is during this period that a full synthesis of Greek and Iranian culture would occur. And one good example of it is the cult of Mithra. Later on, Mithra would be a strong inspiration for the cult of Mithras by Roman legionaries. This cult would be competing with Christianity as a possible successor to the traditional Roman pagan gods. It was inspired by Mithra, but also incorporated a lot of other influences, including beliefs in astrology and divination. It was also a sort of secret society inside the Roman army, with multiple levels of initiation and secret hierarchy, a sort of martial Freemasonry. Going back to the Parthians, a unique feature of the Parthians was a ruling system that was a lot less autocratic. It was aristocratic, in the sense that only the elite had a say in the ruling of the country, but the nobility could decide to depose an unfit king by a vote without the empire devolving into a civil war. Alternatively, even powerful nobles could be demoted or arrested by the king without troubles, as long as the decision was deemed fair enough. This gave Parthia a high level of political stability, something of an advantage against the always divided Greeks and the Romans, experiencing regular and devastating civil wars. Parthia would be a bitter rival to Rome, constantly blocking its expansion eastward. Parthian mounted archers would be a new core for the Persian Empire army, keeping alive the steppes tradition more than the previous nomadic invaders. Their most memorable tactic was the Parthian shot, a backward arrow fired at the pursuing enemy cavalry. In one especially remarkable military campaign, the Parthians would be responsible for the defeat and killing of Crassus the third member of the triumvirate with Caesar and Pompey. They killed him in 53 BC by making him swallow melted gold in punishment for his legendary greed. 
The Sasanian Empire would be the last pagan, as in not Muslim, iteration of the Persian Empire. The best way to look at the Sasanian replacing the Parthian is by looking at the origin of the founders of the dynasty and their ideology. They were from an old Persian noble family, from the same region that Cyrus the Great came from. The empire they built from 224 AD would put back Iranian culture at the center of Persia, with Zoroastrianism turned into a state religion. Hellenization would partially stay, but be much weaker in Iran than in the fringes of the empire, like in the Near East neighbors such as Lebanon and Israel. Other religions would be tolerated, but this characteristic would be essential in distinguishing this new Persian empire from the Roman Empire, now turning into a Christian Empire. Later on, the Sasanian would be the most dangerous and threatening rival to the Eastern Roman Empire, also called the Byzantine Empire. It is during the Sasanian Empire that the Jewish Babylonian Talmud would be composed, as the empire harbored several Jewish centers of learning. The Sasanians saw the rise of Manichaeism, created by the prophet Mani. It was a religion claiming to be the final revelation synthesizing the teaching of Zoroaster, Jesus, and Buddha. As a result, it angered the hierarchies of all the main religions of the time. Manichaeism would spread quickly, even if repressed by the Sasanian Empire's leadership, but would be ultimately crushed by the various governments in the West, China, and the Caliphates, and disappear completely by the 14th century. It would nevertheless be very influential on many Gnostic branches of Christianity like the Cathars. The Sasanian Empire would also be a lot more centralized and urbanized compared to the Parthian culture, more influenced by nomadic lifestyles. The Sasanian Empire would develop relations with the East further than the previous Persian Empire. Since the Bronze Age, trade with India and China had created a prosperous trade network, the Silk Road. It took its name from the invention of silk by the Chinese in the 4th millennium BC, and the beginning of its trade out of China from the time of the Persian Empire. The Sasanian and Chinese would also exchange artists, like musicians and dancers, and they cooperated in defending the Silk Road from the ever-present threat of nomadic pillagers from the center of Eurasia. They would also take over the trade with the Indian Ocean, kicking out the Romans from it. The Sasanian Empire is often described as the height of classical Persian culture, and a lot of their philosophy, architecture style, literature, and engineering would later be considered Muslim by foreigners, as the Sasanian style would be exported to the whole Muslim world. They might have even invented the very first electric battery, the so-called Baghdad Battery. It was a pot with a metal component inside, able to generate electricity, similar to a AAA battery, and we have no idea what it was used for. Just when Muhammad was preaching Islam and federating the Arab tribes, the Sasanian and Byzantine empires had been fighting a multi-decade war of attrition against one another. A plague, known as the Plague of Shiro, also caused a lot of damage in 627 BC. Invasions by Turkish tribes reduced the military capacity of the Sasanian Empire as well. The weakening of the state for the wars had an especially dramatic effect on the Sasanian Empire. When the Sasanian king Khosrau II was killed by his rival, a civil war erupted, with up to 10 people claiming the throne. The civil war lasted four to five years, from 628 to 632 AD. Just when the civil war had ended, the Arab Muslims attacked and invaded Mesopotamia. It was repelled, but then a second attack in 636 AD took from the Sasanian control of all of the land west of modern-day Iran. In 642 AD, another attack started, and the empire would fall less than 10 years later. The Persians would rebel and attack Arab governors and garrisons, but ultimately their resistance would be crushed by reinforcements from the Arabic Peninsula. 
The Conqueror would burn Zoroastrian sacred texts and force conversion on the local population. Many would flee and form the ancestors of the current day Zoroastrian communities in India and elsewhere in Asia. Non Muslims would have to pay a heavy tax called the jizya and could be enslaved. Nevertheless, it would take until the late Middle Age for Islam to become the dominant religion in Iran. This conquest of Persia by Arab Muslims was almost replicated against the Byzantine Empire at the same time. The resulting Rashidun Caliphate would control all of the Middle East, including Iran, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Mesopotamia, as well as parts of Central Asia. The relationship between Persia and Islam is complex. On one hand, Islam has been an imposed religion on the Persians, who resisted mass conversion for centuries. On the other hand, Persian culture has heavily influenced Islam itself. This is especially true for the branch of Islam that spread in Asia, including the Turks that would go on to form the mighty Ottoman Empire. It's fair to say that Islam has changed Persia, but also has not destroyed the uniqueness of the Persian civilization. No more than the invasion by Iranian people destroyed Elamite influence, or the Greek and Parthian conquests did eradicate the Persian culture. The caliphate that would take over the Rashidun Caliphate was the Umayyad Caliphate. While it was an Arab empire first, it also contained multiple elements of Persian culture as well, and drew a lot of its wealth and manpower from Persia and Mesopotamia. It also adopted the Persian administration and court protocol. The Umayyad Caliphate stretched at its peak in 750 AD from Central Asia to the Pyrenees Mountains in the north of modern-day Spain. The enormously overstretched Umayyad Caliphate soon started to fragment into more manageable smaller empires. This was also in part due to a split about who should succeed Muhammad. Due to the religious nature of Muhammad's empire, this split evolved into a religious split as well. Shia Muslims believe Muhammad appointed Ali, Muhammad's cousin, as his successor. Sunni Muslims believed he did not, as that Abu Bakr appointed by a council of senior Muslims was the rightful successor. This resulted in a bitter rivalry that is still alive to this day. Over time, this difference about political succession evolved into differences in theology and culture as well. Shia Islam would initially be most preeminent in Egypt and North Africa. Nowadays, Iran is considered the leader of the Shia world. It is often opposing the rest of the Muslim world in majority Sunni. The Umayyad Caliphate would be replaced by the Abbasid Caliphate. It was formed with the help of an Iranian general and overall would progressively integrate better the old Persian culture and administration to the Arab rulers and their religion. The Abbasid would build Baghdad in 762 AD near the site of ancient Babylon. The city would see the building of the world's first paper mill using Chinese-inspired technology and become an important center of learning for the Muslim world. It would study, preserve, and copy Persian, Roman, and Greek texts. The Abbasids would also trade and exchange with the rest of the world and contribute to the spread in the West of Asian inventions, like the sextant, the number zero, or gunpowder. The Abbasid Empire would struggle to maintain a grasp on a very large empire and progressively lose control over the most distant parts. Morocco in the 830s, Egypt in the 870s, and North Africa in the 920s. From 945 to the 13th century, the area would become controlled by the Seljuk Turks, coming from the Eurasian steppes, like the multitude of Iranian tribes before them. Once again, the pattern of nomads replacing a declining dynasty still hold true. Even if Seljuks ruled, the Abbasids stay nominally in control of the empire. In practice, the Seljuks would control the state and the army, but the Iranian would control the administration. The Abbasid Empire is generally considered as having been the engine behind the Islamic Golden Age. It was a period of scientific development, 
building on previous knowledge from the Egyptian, Persian, Greek, and Roman, and on the exchange of ideas with all the cultures of Eurasia, from Western Europe to India and China. This led to considerable progress in various fields, like medicine, philosophy, astronomy, chemistry, geometry, physics, especially optics, and calculus with the invention of algebra. A lot of the progress done in that time was also due to the work of minorities, like Zoroastrians, Christians, and Jews. Excluded from political power, they could still use their talents as doctors, scientists, and engineers. The Abbasids were also responsible for the production of some of the more well-known Muslim literature, like the 1001 Knight's Tales, likely at first a translation in Arabic of Persian texts, with origin in Indian literature. Additional folklore from Arabic, Persian, Mesopotamian, and Egyptian sources would be added to it. This is where iconic characters like Aladdin, Sinbad, or Alibaba come from. As said before, the Seljuk rule in practice did not disrupt the daily functioning of the Abbasid Caliphate. The regular occurrence of nomads invading and replacing the previous dynasty ruling over Persia would be interrupted by the Mongol invasions. They differed from previous nomads invasions by their scale and brutality. The Mongols would pillage and destroy most of the lands they conquered, culminating with the destruction of Baghdad in 1258. Many more cities than Baghdad were burned to the ground and their civilians slaughtered. The burning of Baghdad, the intellectual center of the Muslim Caliphate, is considered the end of the Islamic Golden Age. A considerable amount of libraries and other intellectual work, as well as mosques, were burned. Another difference between the Mongol invasion and previous nomads' invasions was the widespread destruction of Kanats. Without these hard-to-build irrigation systems, many urban centers and agricultural lands would become uninhabitable. Persia recovered a little under the Mongol Ilkhanate that restored trade and repaired some of the irrigation infrastructures. During the occupation, the majority of the Mongols would convert to Islam they would have a preference for Sufism, a sect of Islam with a predilection for esotericism and mysticism. In many ways, it blended well with the pre-existing Mongols' animist or Buddhist beliefs. Just when Persia was starting to recover, two events would wreck the region. The first reaching Iran in 1349, which would kill ultimately 30% of the population. The second was the invasion by Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane, in 1381. Timur would be the last great nomadic conqueror, and also one of the most brutal conquerors in history. He got his nickname due to injuries to his leg and two missing fingers from arrow wounds suffered in his youth. His tactic was simple. He would ask for unconditional surrender and nothing else. If refused, he would kill or enslave everyone on his path, including the elderly, women, and children. His campaign might have killed as many as 17 million people, a colossal amount equivalent to 5% of the world population at the time. At the time, many believed him to be a forerunner of the apocalypse and maybe the horseman of war. In a paradox when considering his genocidal policies, Timur was also a great patron of the arts, especially architecture and poetry. Built on murder and violence, the Timurid Empire would fail less than a century after Timur's conquests. Persia would be partially ruled successfully by other nomadic tribes onwards, from 1452 AD. The Black Sheep Turkmen, or Karakoyanlu, would be followed by the White Sheep Turkmen, or Akkoyanlu in 1467 AD. The destruction and chaos brought by the successive Mongols' invasions had, maybe for the first time in millenniums, durably shattered the unity of Persia, including its Iranian heartland. The political disorder gave space for religious movements to grow in popularity and restore order. The most influential of them were of Shia inspiration, and the dominance of Shia Islam in Iran dates to this period. Shah Ismail was a religious leader and noble of mixed descent, with his ancestors Turkoman, Kurdish, Greek, and Georgian. 
In a way, this made him a perfect ruler for a land that had been conquered and assimilated so many diverse cultures into its own unique template. Similarly, the nascent Iranian-style Shia Islam would quickly integrate many Sufi orders into Shia Islam. This would increase permanently the theological difference between Iranian Shiism and Arabic Sunnism. Between 1501 and 1511, Shah Ismail would have reconstituted a Persian empire, with familiar borders including Iran, the Caucasus, Turkmenistan, part of Afghanistan, and some control over Mesopotamia. The main struggle for the Safavid Empire would be their powerful western neighbor, the Ottoman Empire. While Iran was overrun by Timur and other nomadic tribes, the Turks had created a powerful empire in Anatolia that would succeed in the century-old goal of the Muslims' empire to conquer Constantinople. The Ottomans also controlled the Balkans, Greece, the Levant, and Egypt. At its peak, it would extend into North Africa and Ukraine and put Vienna under siege twice. Together, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughal empires would form the so-called Islamic Gunpowder Empires. Their expansion and armies were heavily based on the early mastery of gunpowder. They would form stable, rich, innovative, and expansionist empires. The Safavid Empire was a meritocratic society, where people might inherit the position of their father, but only if they prove worthy. The Safavids would have relatively friendly relations with the Mughals, as they were separated by the harsh mountains of Afghanistan and Pakistan. On the opposite, the Safavid and Ottomans would regularly clash over the control of Mesopotamia, the Caucasus, and East Anatolia. This rivalry with the Ottomans contributed to friendly relations with European powers. The Safavids, under Shah Abbas I the Great, would trade with the Dutch East India Company and even establish an alliance with the Austrian Habsburgs. Abbas took back from the Ottomans Baghdad, Eastern Anatolia, and Georgia by 1618. This military success had been made possible due to the modernization of the army, following the model of the British Army and under the instructions of Sir Robert Shirley. The relationship with England was well established, and it was with help from the British Royal Navy that Shah would kick out the Portuguese from Bahrain and Hormuz. Europe would also import from Persia the famous Persian carpets, silk, and other textiles. In general, living standards were equivalent to Europeans, at least for the commoners. However, Western visitors would notice fertile lands not being cultivated, blaming it on poor governance and a lack of interest in agriculture from the ruling elite. Many monuments in Iran standing to this date trace back to the Safavid period, including the several monumental and richly decorated mosques in Isfahan. Isfahan would be a center of learning. But by the mid-17th century, Islamic culture had started to stagnate. The emphasis on respecting older knowledge had turned into a reluctance to innovate or challenge previous assumptions. This would in turn put the country at a disadvantage to Europe, which had started to adopt the scientific method. Successors of Abbas I would prove a lot less competent and are remembered in history as more interested in wine and women than ruling their empire. This gave the neighboring powers increased ambitions, including Russia, which had now been a growing power for two centuries and actively expanding to the east and south. The Russian Empire under Peter the Great would conquer Iran's Caucasian territories in 1723. The regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan would also rebel against their Persian masters. Meanwhile, the Ottomans would also carve out a part of the Iranian territory. The Treaty of Constantinople in 1724 would briefly split Iranian territory between the Russians and the Ottomans. By 1735, most of these territories would be returned to Iran after a rebellion and a new Iran-Ottoman War. The man behind the restoration of an independent Iran in 1735, Nader Shah, would then attack India and pillage Delhi using the stolen riches to finance the reconquest of land long lost to the Ottomans. Over time, he would turn into a paranoid and cruel ruler, 
When he was assassinated in 1747, Persia controlled again the Caucasus, Mesopotamia, and parts of Anatolia. What followed was a long period of anarchy and civil war. The winner of the civil war, who would found the Qajar dynasty in 1796, was Aga Muhammad Khan. His reign would be marked by the goal to re-establish Iranian control over the Caucasus. Like many other countries in that period, Iran would struggle to be independent when faced with increasingly powerful, industrialized, and aggressive European colonial empires. After Aga Muhammad Khan, Iran would permanently lose control over the region to Russia in the two Russo-Persian Wars of 1804-1813 and 1826-1828. And this was despite Russia fighting a very destructive war against Napoleon at the same time. Many Caucasian Muslims would refuse to live under Orthodox Russian rule and migrate to Iran. Later on, the ruling elite would essentially sell the country to foreign power influence, especially bidding Russia and England against each other. England, the colonial ruler of India, was increasingly on a collision course with Russia over the division of Central Asia and Persia. Several revolutions from 1905 to 1911 would weaken the rule of the Shah and increase demands for democratization. This would turn the old aristocratic Persia into the Iranian modern state, but also leave open to foreign domination. In 1907, the Anglo-Russia Convention would divide Iran into two zones of influence. The blatant disregard for the locals' opinion on the matter illustrates the loss of autonomy of Persia by that period. Foreign powers controlled the various factions, fighting for control of the country. The discovery of oil in 1908 contributed to increasing corruption and did little to help modernize and develop the country. In 1921, the UK would be struggling against the Soviet Union for control over Iran and its strategically important oil reserve. For the Soviets, access to the Indian Ocean and the ability to threaten English colonies in the Middle East and India was equally strategically important. With support from the British, Riza Khan would take power and establish the Pahlavi dynasty, which would rule until the 1979 revolution. Riza Khan would establish an authoritarian, nationalist, and militaristic government with a doctrine of secularism and anti-communism. Still, the company modernizes quickly. The authoritarian nature of the regime also made it prone to corruption and oppression. The secularism of the Shah's regime was resented by a devout population in majority Muslim. The tentative to westernized was also poorly accepted, including changes in clothing style, women's liberation, and many socio-economic reforms. During World War II, the Iranian government was initially tempted to side with the Germans. In response, the Soviet and English forces invaded the country. It would be a major transportation road for supplying the Soviet Union with American-made military equipment under the Lend-Lease Agreement. The post-war period would be marked by instability with the unresolved question of the relationship with Western powers. The new Shah, Mohammad Reza, initially ruled in a way that could have prefigured the country, turning it into a constitutional monarchy, akin to the UK or modern Spain. The relationship between the Shah and the democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh would turn sour when the Prime Minister nationalized the British-controlled oil industry. Mossadegh was removed from power in 1952. Before being restored under popular pressure, he would be permanently removed from power in 1953 due to a USA and UK-sponsored coup. From 1953 to 1973, Iran's oil resources would be managed by Western companies. In 1973, in the midst of the 70s oil shock, the Shah would take back control of Iranian oil and use the money to modernize and build a more powerful army. In 1979, the country would be taken over by the Islamic Revolution, transforming the country into the Islamic Republic it is today. Communist activists that contributed to the success of the revolution would be quickly purged. 
resulting in poor relations between Islamic Iran and atheist communist Soviets. Iran would cut all relations with the West, with the Iran hostage crisis a focal point. One year later, Saddam Hussein hoped to profit from the disorder in Iran to expand Iraq's territories, especially in oil-rich areas. Iraq was supported by the USA, the USSR, France, the UK, Egypt, and the Arab countries. Currently, Iran is under sanctions from the West for its nuclear program. Regionally, it's exerting influence over traditional Persian space like Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, but also Yemen. It's also improving its relations with China and Russia and is joining China-led international organizations like the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The Persian Empire today is known for being one of the most dominant and powerful empires throughout the course of history. Over thousands of years, the Persians have made numerous integral contributions to the world, from industry to culture.